So, yeah, this title photo is uh, one of my favorite photos. It's a photo I took locally um, in Washington of a wolf eel. Uh, these guys are pretty friendly, and, and this um, person on the right side is, is a friend of mine, and um, we were just hanging out with this eel taking photos. Uh, it's kind of cool when you know a little bit about the biology of the fish when you're, when you're photographing them. Um, wolf eels in particular, they live in dens with a mate and they mate for life. Um, and they're also, uh, if, if one of the wolf eels dies, uh, it won't find another mate. So um, they're per pretty charismatic and, and fun to photograph and a lot less scary than they, they look. So uh, I think Sherry gave a really good introduction. Um, I, and she went over all of this, so I'll, I'll skip this slide. Um, I put this uh, in for, I think, a photo workshop, but I do specialize in low light wide angle photography. Um, Snoop photography, which is a tool that people use to create black backgrounds in their photos. Um, and yeah, I know a lot about photo and video gear. Um, I actually write camera reviews for a living, so that's kind of what I do and, and mostly um, they're all underwater camera reviews. So. Um, so underwater photography is, well, it's hard to define it, but for the most part, it's the art of capturing beauty um, of any subjects in an aquatic matrix. So anything in the water, um, you can take photos of anything from people in a pool to um, fish in the ocean and any, anything in between. Um, the reason it's almost a separate field from photography altogether is the way that uh, light interacts with the water. Um, so this is just a quick slide of how light works underwater. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry for all the animations. So um, in the water, uh, there's a process called light attenuation. It's a natural phenomenon where basically you lose your warmer colors of the rainbow as you go deeper underwater. So that what that means is that you have less red light the farther you go down in orange and then yellow and it um, goes all the way down to blue and then eventually becomes dark and uh, at the, you know, at abyssal depths. But uh, when you're diving or swimming underwater, for the most part, um, the loss of colors uh, can be pretty ap applicable to where you are at depth. So if you're at 15 feet, you're not going to see any reds. 25 feet, you're not going to have orange. 35, you're not going to have yellow. So the water will get bluer and bluer, and everything you're looking at will get bluer and bluer. Now, the reason you can dive down pretty deep and still see colors is because your brain actually knows this is happening. And you compensate um, for that. Now, if you're taking a photograph uh, and you're deeper than you know, let's say 25 feet, if you just take a photo, anything that might have red on it, so if there's a red fish, it's going to look brown or black. Um, there's not going to be any red in your photo because the camera is not going to compensate for that. So um, as underwater photographers, there's a few ways we can get around that. The biggest thing is adding white light underwater. So we'll use um, underwater strobes, basically giant flashes that will add color um, into the images. Uh, another thing that water does is it magnifies um, animals. So that's why sometimes if you're snorkeling and you see this giant fish and you say, oh, I saw a fish and it was this big, um, it's not actually that big. It's, it's going to be 30% smaller <laughs> than in, in reality. So um, it can often seem like you're looking at something bigger than you are. And that's the same when you put a camera behind um, a port, a flat glass port, um, when you put it inside of an underwater housing, everything is going to seem bigger to that camera. Now, there's a way to get around that, which is using a dome port, which it, it is what it sounds. It, it's a glass dome that you can put over the, the housing, and then all of a sudden, um, all those animals in the water will be the correct size. Um, and then there's another process where light will actually bend as it goes through water and then or as it goes through air and then hits water and it can create um, this kind of window. If you've ever seen a photo or maybe a t-shirt or um, just a movie where you're looking up and you see, you know, the silhouette of a shark and it looks like you're looking through a tunnel, that tunnel is called Snell's window and that's because light actually will, will bend as it goes from air to water and that can 
affect how you take your images. Um, so this is a camera. It's not my camera. It's just a camera I was testing. Um, I just wanted to show you that this is kind of a normal everyday use camera that people buy for any kind of photography. And this is what we put it inside. So this is an underwater housing. So um, often when I do my reviews, I work specifically with a company called Eichlite. And this is an Eichlite housing. There's different underwater housing manufacturers and it's actually become its own kind of equipment industry. Um, so when I write equipment reviews, I'll write for different manufacturers about all their different equipment um, and what it's like to take photos with certain cameras. So if you look at the two things on the sides, um, if you see my mouse here and then over here, these are strobes. They're basically giant flashes. They're much brighter than any flash you'll have above water. And that's because light is absorbed underwater. So you need a lot of power to actually illuminate your subjects. Um, these batteries are pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the, so the, the flash here, uh, half of that is a battery and they're, they're pretty heavy and, and, and bulky, but it gets the job done when you're trying to light an image. Uh, this red thing above the housing right there, that's called a TTL converter. And what that does is it actually senses the amount of light in the water and it tells your, your strobes right here, um, it tells your strobes how much light to put out. So this is almost like taking automatic photos with your strobes. Otherwise, some people choose not to use this TTL converter and they'll actually manually adjust the strobe power. Um, and I do both. Uh, if you look at this cable that goes to the strobes from the camera housing, um, that cable will tell the strobes to fire when you press the um, shutter button on the camera. So when you take, click it to take a picture, uh, it'll send an electrical signal through the cables and tell the strobes to fire. Um, these arms are just mechanical. They're used so you can position your strobes uh, and get different types of lighting. And then all these knobs and buttons are, are actually physically controlling the camera inside the housing. So if you press an, one of those buttons, it'll press a button on the camera. Um, and same with the knobs. Um, a system like this can be fairly expensive, but there are less complicated systems that are actually fairly affordable. Um, and underwater photography is, is definitely something that you know, most people will have access to if they um, try. So um, just a few things about underwater composition. There's three basic rules. Uh, I think it's exemplified in this photo of a pufferfish. Um, you wanna get as low as possible to your subject. You wanna get as close as possible so you get as much color from your strobes and you wanna shoot up. Uh, it's different above water. If you're taking a photo of a person, you generally wanna shoot down um, underwater, you're going to want to shoot up almost always. So, um, great. Now, um, sorry, I'm going to close my window. I think there's a truck outside. <laughs> All right. So um, the other uh, kind of the other important rule for composition is the rule of thirds. And you'll see in most underwater photos and most photos in general that a photo should be split into thirds. And generally it's a good idea to have diagonal lines in the photo as well. As you can see in this vertical image, there's a diagonal line here um, in multiple instances. So you have your subject, which is diagonally, diagonally going across the frame. You've got your foreground and your background, which are doing the same thing. Um, in this case, this might be a less compelling image on the right side uh, because it's not so diagonal, but it does show the rule of thirds where you have, you know, one third roughly for the background, one third for the subject, and one third for the foreground. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting note. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got into underwater photography. Um, this is my first underwater photo. Uh, I took it in a tide pool on the coast of California when I was in high school. Um, with a little Fujifilm camera um, that my parents got me. Uh, now, I think at the time it was probably about a hundred dollar camera. Um, and they gave it to me because I already ruined another camera when I got hit by a wave and it got wet. So this Fujifilm camera could go, you know, a few feet in the water. Um, this was taken maybe, you know, six inches in the water of some snails. Um, but there's some you know, camera technology has really gone way past this. And there's some really amazing cameras 
that um, can be purchased for you know two three hundred dollars um, that can go up to 50 feet underwater and take much better photos than this so um, yeah this was me as a docent in uh, in California so I used to take photos just to categorize things and and all the stuff that I found I would I would just want to learn as much as I could about it so I'd uh, take photos so I could refer to them, look through my guidebooks, write them down. Um, and eventually I started taking photos because I thought they looked pretty. And, and that's where um, I really got into underwater photography. Uh, so this is just, I'm going to run through kind of my story on becoming an underwater photographer and, and the steps to becoming an underwater photographer, if that's your aspiration. Um, it can be a complicated journey and it always is. Um, so my first, uh, my first suggestion is to, you know, study hard at whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and that could just be being outside, going into the ocean, um, swimming, going underwater, maybe even just going into your pool and looking at light. Um, this is me in, at, at the Belize program in AOI um, over here. Uh, and yeah, and uh, try to learn as much as you can about the creatures that you're photographing. That's going to be the biggest measure of success as a photographer. It's not really the equipment that you have, the, um, you know, the knowledge that you have about photography. It's more that you know how a creature is going to um, react to your presence and, and, and knowing how to photograph it and anticipate it. Um, that That's the hardest thing to do when you're underwater is just getting close to a subject. Um, as I mentioned, one of the biggest rules is get close so you can get colors. So sometimes I'll be, you know, within six inches of an animal when I'm photographing it. I'd say 90% of the time that's the case. Um, are there any questions that, so far, by the way? I just want to inter interject. We were so young back then, near Palm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, uh, yeah, it's been, been a little while. So, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, when I went to Belize and I, I did the, um, Belize program, it really kind of taught me a new type of underwater photography and got me even more into it. Cause I, I, well, I felt tropical water for the first time, which is very different than swimming in Maine or California. Um, and it can be a lot more fun taking photos. Um, and the water's clear, so that also kind of will um, create a different situation uh, for taking your photos. Now, um, as I mentioned before, there's a few good starter cameras when you when you in first your get. Palm, in... Can I ask, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, definitely. Um, Emily Emily had a question and asked: sure. Does the underwater strobe ever startle your um, subjects? That's a really good question. So yes, um, it does. It, uh, some subjects don't seem to care at all. Usually the subjects that are more shallow and, and around during the daytime because the light, it, you're actually fighting the sun quite a bit. So the light's not too much brighter than the sun. Um, but if you're, if you're taking a photo at night or if you're taking, um, you know, photos of certain subjects, they do get startled. I've seen puffer fish run into walls after getting the photo taken. It can be a lot like getting your photo taken as a person. Um, I do my best to try to, you know, be as kind to the animals as possible. Um, there used to be an issue where, you know, people um, didn't know if, to, there's these small animals called pygmy seahorses. They're about the size of a grain of rice and they're seahorses. They're really amazing and they're one of the top subjects to take a photo of. Uh, it used to be people thought that if you took more than five photos it would kill the seahorse because you'd have um, too much light and they don't have um, eyelids or anything to protect themselves. Uh, it, there was a scientific study recently that proved that they're actually not affected by strobe light. So I guess that was a myth. Um, yeah, so good, good question. Um, so in, in terms of cameras, um, if you guys are ever interested in getting into underwater photography, there's some good starter cameras that are pretty accessible, not more than any other camera that you might buy, um, which are, you know, the GoPro. Um, GoPros are actually pretty amazing cameras. And yeah, I, I highly recommend them, especially if you're into video. And then the Olympus TG6 is 
the camera that most people start with now. Um, it used to be that there really weren't many cameras to start with. It used to be a big investment, but now the TG6 is a small camera. You can take it down to 50 feet without a housing. And yeah, it's a really nice system. So. Oh, and then um, I did forget to mention, uh, I actually learned underwater photography from this website here, uh, uwphotographyguide.com. Um, it was created by my boss about 10 years ago. I read the whole website, um, learned underwater photography, and then um, that, that's actually the website that I currently uh, run. All right, um, yeah, these are just a few photos from the Belize trip. Um, and I just realized I, it's AIO, sorry, not AOI. Um, AOI is a brand that I work with, so I just accidentally typed that in. So yeah, sorry about that, Sherry. No worries. A lot of people do that. You'd be amazed. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a brand that I work with. I got so used to typing, typing that. Um, anyway, the Belize trip was awesome. Uh, I really learned, I think I learned a lot more about underwater photography there than anywhere else, just because it's clear water. Um, I learned about how animals interact. It's a lot different than trying to take photos in California or Maine. Uh, things get really close to you and, it, and it, you're able to kind of learn a lot about photography that way. Um, I'm giving some of my old cameras to um, AIO, so hopefully, uh, you know, people will be able to um, use those on, on the trips. Um, so if they're still usable cameras, we'll see. Um, so the step two is kind of, you, you want to get your name out there once you start taking photos. Uh, it can be a little bit disheartening at first when you see how many amazing photos there are and yours might not look the same when you're starting. Um, but it really just takes practice. Um, it, it, it takes waiting, you know, for the most part. Um, I try to avoid, like if I see a situation where there's a cool subject, but it's not a good situation for a photo, I won't take a photo. So a lot of underwater photography is patience. Um, but then once you get those good photos, um, try to enter underwater photo competitions. It's not only great to get your name out there, but it's also really great because if you win, most of the times you get a free dive trip or a free trip somewhere. Um, and you don't have to be a diver to take underwater photos. You can free dive, which is, you know, diving without a tank. So you can kind of learn how to dive down. And I can actually go down about 60 to 80 feet without a tank. Um, but, you know, you have to be careful and always go with a buddy. Um, or you can snorkel um, in a pool. You know, all these underwater photo competitions, you can take photos via any method. So um, it, it can be a big... Uh, help when you're when you're trying to start a career as an underwater photographer. Um, the photo in the middle is the first photo competition I, I won, or the photo in, that I won in a competition. I took that when I was 15 and I, I ended up getting an internship um, with the underwater photography guide and a company called Blue Water Photo. Um, and that's kind of how I got my foot into underwater photography. Uh, these other two photos on the left and right, they're also competitions that I won um, as a teenager, I didn't have much money to travel, so uh, that's what got me out traveling and, and going on, on trips, uh, diving. Um, it's, it was just photo competitions. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of a surprising thing, but there's actually a lot out there. Um, we run the Ocean Art Underwater Photography Contest. There's a few others. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of prizes out there. So... The next thing I recommend doing if, if you're, you know, getting into photography, underwater photography, or any kind of creative media, um, definitely create a website and it's a lot easier than it seems. Um, it can be a financial investment to remove the ads, but there are free ways to create a website. So uh, I think Squarespace and, and Wix are probably the two top website builders if you're going to create a website without knowing programming. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I would probably recommend. If you ever want to sell any of your photos or anything else, um, I would look into Shopify, but that does require serious financial investment and, and a real business mentality if you're going to go in, into that. But um, those are kind of the three that I would recommend without programming experience. Um, if you have a little bit more technical experience, WordPress is also pretty good. Um, and you can do WordPress without programming experience, but uh, I find that you have to just be a little bit more technical to use that. Um, 
Yeah, so so my website is photosfromthesea.com. Um, my name is kind of difficult, so that's why I chose that name. Um, sometimes the name's important also to get found on Google. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, you can always reach out to me and we can, we can talk about websites. But um, I also recommend creating your own social media presence. Uh, I know a lot of people do it for fun, but it's actually a business. Um, you know, if you create an Instagram account, Facebook account, start posting your photos, start talking about your photos. Uh, it really helps get you a presence. And ultimately what you want is you want traffic because that's um, monetarily how you can make money from underwater photography. The, the world's kind of changed with the internet and with social media. And uh, it's a different way of being an underwater photography now than it was um, 20 years ago. So yeah. Uh, this is kind of just a quick thing about, um, you know, monetizing your photography. Uh, I know I get asked that a lot and it's, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult question. Like how to make, how do I make money with my photos? Um, it used to be that you could sell your photos to a magazine or, um, to people, but, uh, with digital photography, photos are now accessible to anybody and you can get any kind of photo from anywhere. Um, stock photo agencies are selling photos for fairly uh, for for fairly cheap. So um, photos are now cheap. Knowledge is expensive. So when you're a photographer, particularly an underwater photographer, um, you want to sell your knowledge. Um, and there's different ways to do that. So once you have a website or um, anywhere to put your photos, it could be a gallery. Um, you want to get as much traffic there as possible. So I recommend taking courses or just learning on YouTube about marketing and SEO, which stands for search engine optimization. Um, SEO is basically the art form of getting your stuff found on Google. Um, so getting to those first few uh, places on Google is, is, is very, very helpful uh, in any business that you might have. Um, and, and this will translate to any kind of business. If you ever want to even if it's not underwater photography, you'll, you'll always want to learn how to get yourself found on Google. Um, now, if you do have, you know, really great photography, you've got, you know, your skills um, sharpened up and you, and you think you can compete with other underwater photographers um, that might be making money off their photos, um, that's when you want to start f finding um, partners in the industry. So you want to reach out to either scuba diving operators, um, tourism boards, different organizations that deal with, um, with travel, which I know now is not probably the best time to do so. But um, once you reach out to them, you want to say, hey, I take all these photos. Here's my portfolio. Um, here's my website. This is how much traffic I get. Uh, would you be interested in giving me a free trip or paying for some photos or having me come out, write an article? Um, and, and that is often the best way to make money or to um, fund your own travel experiences through your photography. Um, a lot of, especially with underwater photography, a lot of companies will be open to it. Uh, it's less so if you're just doing above water photography since there's a lot of Instagram influencers that already fill that niche. Um, and then you can use your knowledge, and, and this is what I do, but you, you, news, you, you use your knowledge to teach. So once you know, let's say a specific animal or a specific uh, type of photo or a specific camera system, or you just know about photography or even biology, um, a lot of people will, you know, are, are uh, willing to learn and, and want to know what you have to say. Um, so once you have all that experience, you can monetize teaching, um, whether you're doing it through, you know, a summer camp or, um, you're leading under, you know, photo workshops, which is what I do. Um, or you're just teaching people by the articles that you write, you know, like with reviews. Um, you can turn a lot of that traffic into advertising money also by putting ads on your website and that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also more traditional routes where you can monetize photography, like taking photos at events. Um, pool portraits are becoming a really popular thing. Uh, I think especially pool pet portraits like of dogs. Um, there's a really famous photographer who takes photos and I think they make their living just by taking photos of dogs jumping into pools, catching balls. Um, and they have some really amazing stuff. 
Um, and then there's still stock photo websites you can always sell your photos to, but they generally will not make a living. It's just um, some money on the side. Um, but that can be a good, a good outlet if you have a lot of photos and you want to get your stuff out there. Um, but the important thing is to find your niche. Uh, it's to find, find what you love. And, and if it's different enough um, from what's already out there, you'll find that people will end up reaching out to you about your work. Um, I find that for some reason my niche is uh, taking photos of wolf eels, which is that, that eel in that first photo. I get reached out a lot about wolf eels, um, sometimes about octopus. It, it just depends. Um, and then, of course, taking uh, writing camera reviews. I, I end up um, having a lot of people reach out to me about that. Um, and then finally, I mean, the, the ultimate goal is to make a difference with your photography. Um, I, I spent a while um, as a scientist on, on fishing boats, taking fisheries data, but I didn't find it as rewarding as telling stories with my photos um, and teaching people to do that. I, I think that I've probably made a bigger impact that way just by teaching people to take photos and by going out and, and, um, and trying to do conservation work. So um, now there's a few things that, that are kind of important to remember when you're taking photos. Um, in order to make that difference and to to show the world what's happening underwater and and get people to care about the oceans um, So you want to photograph what's ugly and uncomfortable. So, you know, if you find um, let's say it's a fish in a net or um, You know something that's died from oil pollution I I used to not take photos of that because I I didn't like it or, or plastic in the water um, but now I have to remind myself that it's important to take those photos because uh, people need to know what's happening underwater and they can't see it. Um, you want to try to tell a story with your photos as well. Uh, so you don't want to just take one photo and call it quits. You might want to take a photo series or um, take a photo of an event or something that's happening and, and share your experience and, and write about it. Um, you know, Photos can tell a lot, but when you're writing about things, especially on social media, things get shared. Um, I, I tend to find that the more I write about a situation or a story, the more people react to it and, and feel like it's a genuine experience and then they share it and that's what makes a difference. Um, and then finally, don't be afraid to reach out to people if you have a photo or a story or something interesting. Um, I, write, I reach out to news organizations all the time. Um, and I actually work with hundreds of, of uh, new news organizations on, on you know, making, uh, on putting people's photos out there, mostly through our underwater photo contest, but um, it translates to millions of people being able to see all these photos from around the world, from our oceans, and, and people caring about that. So um, that's been one of the most re rewarding parts of my jobs, um, and also one of the more difficult parts. Um, let's see, where are we? Yeah, okay, we're pretty good on time. So I was just gonna go over a few of my favorite photos that I've taken um, recently, most recently, and, and the situations behind that, some of the lighting techniques. Um, Sherry, are, are we, did you wanna do a and a You said around 45 minutes in? Yeah, I'm, it's pretty open, depending on how long you've got and people have, but if people either want to unmute and ask a question or put the question in the chat. Either way, I'll share it and we'll get it answered. Okay, great. Um, well, I think now's a good time for any questions about, you know, becoming an underwater photographer before I get into, um, before I get into these photos that I've taken and some of the techniques. I actually have a, a couple questions. You yeah. mentioned um, it takes a lot of your time. It's difficult. The, the working with the news organizations and all that how much of your time is actually spent in the water taking photos in your career would you say versus how much time you have to spend outside of that to to keep the business going yeah so that's a good question so um i'm actually one of the lucky ones i'm probably the most lucky one <laughs> um, i spend a lot of time in the water and most people don't so um i spend I, i'll probably dive between once or twice uh, a week. And then I also go, I mean, in a normal year, if there's not a pandemic, um, I'll travel anywhere from two to six times a year um, and do, uh, you know, up to a month or two months out of the year, just diving. 
Um, and that's every day, four times a day. Um, but yeah, and then all the rest it's spent, um, you know, working on, on um, either marketing for photo stores or, or writing about um, underwater camera systems. Uh, a lot of other people, it can depend. If, if your main business is photo workshops, you'll spend a lot more time underwater. Um, it's a much harder niche. There's probably only a few people that really make a business that way. Um, and then a lot more people will, will try to make deals to go, they might dive a few times a year and then they'll use those photos to kind of um, propel their career the rest of the time. It, it's really situation based and, and the niche that you find that determines how much time you spend. And uh, James was asking, do you use a rebreather? That's a good question. So um, for those of you that don't know, a rebreather is a, um, a diving system that actually uh, circulates air that you breathe. And when you breathe out, it keeps the air in the system and then it filters out all that carbon dioxide. So you're rebreathing all your air. Um, they're a lot more expensive to maintain and, and uh, a little bit more dangerous to use when you're underwater. So um, I personally don't just because I find that for all my purposes, scuba diving is totally fine with an open circuit system. Um, but it can help you get closer to animals because you're not having bubbles and there's no noise. So when you're underwater, it's actually really loud. Um, you sound like Darth Vader all the time and the fish can hear that. They don't really like that. So um, when you're using a rebreather, you're actually completely silent. So it's a completely different experience. But, hmm. yeah. So Emily asks, uh, what social media platforms have you found to be the most useful for marketing and outreach? That's a good question. Um, so Instagram, well, it used to be Facebook, but Facebook's been changing their algorithms and they're actually less favorable towards businesses now. They want you to pay for advertising. So I'd say it depends on how much money you have. <laughs> if you want to pay a lot for advertising, Facebook is still the way to go. But Instagram is, is generally a great place to start. Um, I think if you're on Instagram, you want to post a photo a day, which can be kind of taxing, um, but that's the best way to get out there. Um, and you'll find that people will follow you. And, and really Instagram, for some reason, the, the quality of the photography doesn't matter as much as, as the way you present it. Um, now, Facebook's a little bit of a different story. It's more of an advertising platform at this point. So if you have a business or um, you're marketing something, you'll wanna pay for ads. Um, yeah, and then I'd say Twitter's not as effective anymore. Um, and TikTok could be the future. I don't really know. I haven't put much effort into it, um, but it seems to be where everybody is at these days. So, no, it makes sense. I know. I don't know what's going to happen with TikTok. So, yeah, yeah, um, I think nobody knows at this point. Yeah. Uh, so, Anna asks, "Do you learn about the animals you photograph before you dive?" That's a good question. So, um, if it's a, if it's yeah, if it's an important subject to me, I will learn as much as I can. Um, generally, if you look at guidebooks, they'll actually tell you how shy a creature is or a good way to approach, um, especially if they're a popular creature. I'll learn about, you know, where they live, how they live, um, have, how, how to find them is probably the, the hardest thing. And, and that's where I'll try to reach out to people and ask, hey, how do I find these animals? Um, but the best place to learn is underwater. Um, I, I, generally don't have much success the first few times I go looking for an animal and then I get better each time. So, um, so you do, so you, when you're going in the water often, are you, you're looking for a particular animal or are you just going in there to explore and see what you find? Uh, it depends where I am. Um, for the most part, especially around here, I, I'm going for a specific reason and I'm looking for a specific animal. Um, and generally because I've done so many dives in the Northwest, I know where to find things. Um, if it's a new place, I'll just, I'll look and I find I get better photos when I'm not looking for something. And that's just because I'm, I'm looking more through my eye as an artist, uh, than through the eye of somebody who's looking for something. Right. Um, that being said, planning out a shot beforehand is, is much, uh, much more effective. So I have been in situations where I planned out a photo and it's come out really nice. Good. Hey, so you mentioned the housing was really expensive. Uh, I guess if you're talking to someone who says they want to become, they'd like to start doing some underwater photography. Yeah. 
what's a ballpark generally of what you would be looking to spend without getting say the best equipment but because you just want to start and you want to try it but you want to get some decent underwater photos yeah you know what, um, are, what are we looking at for like you know how much they would have to spend do you think generally yeah so uh, generally like on the on the low end of things um i think the tg5 tg6 uh which is still a good camera now and i would get one before olympus um closes its doors because <laughs> they actually just sold their company but um, the Olympus TG5 and TG6 is about 300 um, and there are cameras that are cheaper in the 100 range that'll still go underwater but that camera is really nice for macro so close-up photography um, and it can go down to 50 feet without a housing. Now when you add a housing generally it's the same price as the camera so um, I'd say a mid-range system would probably cost about 5,000 for the strobes that camera the housing and then a higher end system um you're looking more at like 10 to 15,000 and then cinema systems are then you're looking at you know 40 to 100,000 but th that's for movies and stuff like that right right so that's so someone who just wanted to start out might yeah. uh, just get a good underwater camera to start and see so does that olympus will that take like will you see colors does it give you a flash or a light or something yeah so the olympus has a built-in flash um and then uh, uh when you yeah there's there's different ways so you can use a, a video light um an underwater video light or um and those can be you know only a hundred dollars or so um strobes are pretty expensive so that, that can be in the 300 to 800 dollar range um but the internal flash will be okay for getting uh, photos of small things pretty close up. Um, so that's generally the route that I, I tell people to go when they're first starting. Um, and those are about, like I said, 300. GoPros are also great, especially if you want to do video. And they automatically color correct. So you don't need a flash for those. Um, and you'll still get some colors underwater um, to pretty deep depths. I mean, down at least 50 feet. Yeah, I actually a uh, couple of times have put my GoPro into the lobster trap oh, and cool. uh, sent it down and uh, got it back. And it's very, you know, a lot of plankton in the water in Maine. So yeah. the water is very green. But uh, but I got some some great views of the lobsters moving around in the in and out of the um, trap. So it was really it was really a great thing to use. But yeah, good. so but. Oh yeah, and those are usually in the three to four hundred range, and I'd recommend the Hero Seven or the Hero Eight, um, two of the newer cameras. They're really, really good for underwater. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back on the Hero Three still. So oh, okay, I yeah. <laughs> I think they've really, uh, they've really gotten they've better. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've got that digital. Now they have the the screen and, and yeah, they have yeah, screen. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're much, much nicer now. So yeah, uh, great. Does anyone um, have any other? Questions before Nirapam shows us through some of his photographs. And actually, um, maybe you could just tell us also what kinds of other classes they would find at the Blue Water University at that website. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a wide range of classes. So um, for those of you that don't know, Blue Water University is um, an online educational platform that we recently created. Um, and it's the main focus was kind of to teach underwater photography. Um, there's a variety of free and paid classes. So uh, you can learn underwater photography, but there's also classes from scientists about marine life and marine science. Um, we've had some pretty good ones. Um, we have an oceanographer that, that teaches on there sometimes um, who, who teaches about ocean acidification and that kind of thing. And uh, we have a manta ray researcher who teaches about sharks and rays. Um, researcher sorry uh and yeah so we have a wide range there um we also have classes about travel and, and um, dive travel specifically um underwater video uh, editing so editing photos is a, kind of a big thing especially with underwater photos um and i wasn't going to get too much into photo editing but that's a whole another a whole nother topic there um and then I think, yeah, and then we have one-on-one -on -one classes as well for, for different topics, mostly underwater photography. Excellent, thanks.
So yes, um, I when I sent it out to people, I sent the link to that uh, to the Blue Water University to that website. So I'm happy to I'll post it up again when we uh, post the the this recording as well to YouTube. So if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to let Nira Palm kind of show us his photos, and we'll let him go from there. Yeah. All right. Um, so, oh, and if you do have a question, feel free to interrupt me. You can unmute yourself anytime. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I'd start with uh, my my favorite photo series um, from the area. Um, and I didn't put that many photos uh, in here just because I, I didn't think I would have that much time. Um, and I'm happy to go back to my website to show you some more. But um, so my favorite photo series is uh, this photo I took, or this one dive that I did with a giant Pacific octopus. And um, for those of you that don't know, the giant Pacific octopus is native to the Eastern Pacific and Northern Pacific. Um, so, you know, anywhere from Washington to Japan. Um, the record, I believe, is 30 feet. So they're the largest octopus or largest cephalopod, I believe. No, largest octopus, because there's a giant squid. So largest octopus in the world. Um, they are generally fairly solitary um, and shy of people, so they hide in a little den or in a den, and they'll they'll tighten up pretty pretty nicely in that den. Um, they can get through openings, I think, the size of a bottle, um, depending on their size. And uh, they come out at night, and then they'll eat crustaceans. So th the best way to find a giant Pacific octopus is to look for a pile of clam shells or crab shells. And, and that's, you know, that's one of that local, you know, one of those local knowledge things that you have to, to learn when you're looking for these animals. So um, it, I, I try looking for piles. I found, you know, find a hole and often there's an octopus in there. Uh, this is one of those rare instances where the octopus was um, completely out in the open during the daytime um, in clear, clear water. So the visibility was actually um, probably 40 to 50 feet. Um, it was bluish water, which is rare for the Puget Sound. Um, in this case, this octopus was photographed just north of Washington in Canada. And um, I spent my whole 70 minute dive with him until I ran out of air. So this octopus was actually really curious. It was following me around. Um, it was checking me out as much as I was checking him out. And I managed to take 500 photos of him. Um, and it was basically anywhere I swam, it would it would come come join me. So um, yeah, so this is uh, when the octopus was traveling across the reef. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. It's an interesting photo because one of the main rules of underwater photography is you want the the eye of the animal in focus. But I did something different here. I put the the tentacles in focus, um, so you can see how big the suckers are. Each sucker is probably maybe three to four inches in diameter. Um, and that fish in the background is a rockfish, and that fish is, you know, probably a foot long, so you can get a, an idea of the size. It was a big octopus, um, definitely larger than I was. So uh, one of the also interesting things here is, is if you see this glowing light in the corner, that light is coming from the sun. One of the difficult things with underwater photography is getting a, a nice blue background or any kind of color in your background. Um, since if you're shooting away from the sun, everything ends up turning kind of dark behind your subject since there's no light coming from that direction. So what, there's a few tricks to doing that. Um, if you have a good camera, you can increase your ISO. Um, and otherwise, uh, it, you can lower your shutter speed. Now, for, for those of you that don't know, when it comes to photography in general, there's three things that control your exposure, which is how bright your image is. There's your aperture, which is the opening um, in the lens, your shutter speed, which is how quickly the camera will take the photo, and then your ISO, which is how sensitive your camera is to light. Um, they each have their drawbacks and they each affect the image in a different way. Um, now, I don't expect you guys to remember any of this, but uh, my aperture was a little bit um, too open. So the f-stop, which is what controls the aperture, was kind of low in number. And that's why you're getting this blur in the background, but it's also open enough so you get this light coming in. I had the shutter speed high. 
um, because this animal was moving. So if it was a low shutter speed, it, you'd get blur in the image from the motion. Um, and then the ISO I tried to keep low because if you bring up your ISO or the sensitivity of the camera, it'll actually introduce noise into the image. So those are kind of three things to know about this image. Um, again, it, it was it's hard to get that that glowing light in the background. So um, it's the same same thing with this photo. But I really love this photo because the eyes tack sharp, it's in focus. The um, octopus was getting really close to me. I mean, um, I was using a wide angle lens here. So in this case, it was a Nikon eight to fifteen millimeter fisheye, and it's a hundred eighty degree field of view. So in order for me to get that animal that much in the frame. I actually had to be within a few inches of its eye. Um, so I was only maybe three to four inches of the eye. Uh, Fisheye lenses let you get really close to subjects and focus really close, but they make everything look small. So you have to compensate by getting really close, which means you can get really good colors like I did in this image. Um, and then this is when the octopus got interested in my camera. So it just started feeling around. It was literally touching the dome for it at this point. Um, and uh, I was using a TTL converter, which I mentioned earlier, um, which automatically adjusts your strobe power. And that's the only way I could have shot this photo because everything was happening so quick. Um, I basically held down the camera shutter and it just started you know, clicking at three frames a second and the strobes were firing that quickly. Um, and because the octopus was getting so close to the to the um, to the lens, I needed to have something that would be automatic when it came to my strobe power. Uh, a little bit about photo editing here. I needed to brighten up the octopus's tentacle a little bit so you can see the the orange color. Um, now, when it comes to photo editing, a lot of people think that editing a photo is cheating. But what they don't realize is that what your camera does is it actually takes all the information it's collecting and it edits it using the software that's put in there by Nikon or Canon or Sony. So as an underwater photographer, it's better to edit a photo on your own um, instead of letting the camera do that. Uh, and, and we do that by editing what's called a raw file. So that's the actual data that's coming from your camera. It's not the JPEG file, which is what you're sharing to Facebook. So I take the raw file, I do my own edits. Um, that way it's my photo, it's not Nikon's photo, it's not Canon's photo. Um, you know, it's, it's not cheating because that's what a camera does. Um, and it, it, doing it yourself is, is the artistry in, the, in, in, the, um, in photography, really. Uh, if you actually take a raw file, if, you, if any of you have ever seen one, it actually looks washed out and it's not something I would ever share. Um, and the reason for that is you have so much data in there, it actually doesn't look good. So that's why cameras will edit that raw file. Um, so any, any questions about this photo series? It's, it's, uh... Somebody, um, uh, Sarah asked if you had other animals like this that have come up to you and kind of surprised you and hung out with you. Yeah, I, I think wolf eels do that pretty regularly. Um, so I, I, the title image that you saw there was, was a wolf eel. Um, I can share some more photos from my website too if we have some time and you can see other ones that do that. Um, I've had a sheephead, which is a, a type of fish in California. Um, it's related to a wrasse. I've had one of those follow me around the whole dive and I ended up getting a piece of kelp and started playing tug of war with it because um, it was just really smart and charismatic. It seemed to want our company. so. Um, sometimes, yeah, there, there's a lot more to fish and a lot more to a lot of these creatures and people realize they, they do have personalities and, and um, some can, you know, want to hang out with you more than others. Uh, sea lions are very, very playful. They like to hang out with people quite a bit. Um, they're known for that. So if you don't like, you know, if you don't want a sea lion to be rough with you, I don't recommend going in a sea lion. They, they like to kind of nip at your fins or they'll um, I've had one bite my head trying to take my hood off. Um, now it, it wasn't aggressive, so it wasn't doing that hard, but um, they'll, they'll interact with people quite a bit. They'll blow bubbles in your face and bark at you. So that, that can be kind of cool. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, I mean, there's a lot of situations where, 
where that's kind of happened. This is just one of my favorite. Um, yeah, I, I generally find fish are more charismatic than invertebrates. Invertebrates are, are, are probably not as intelligent. So. <laughs> um, and then a lot of mammals are actually a little less charismatic other than sea lions because they get shy. So dolphins actually are shyer than you might expect. Um, whales are also pretty shy. It, it can, you have to go to certain locations to get good dolphin or whale photos. Um, and often you're just taking a photo as they swim by. So. All right, so I put this photo in there because it's one of my favorites. It's also one of the more abstract photos that I've taken. Um, and I think it's just an interesting photo when it comes to showing technique. So I, I use two things in this photo, two tools that aren't very typical for topside photography. I used what's called a magic tube to create that circular effect, and then I used um, a snoot. So um, a magic tube is basically a, a pipe that has a reflective surface on the inside, and it's, I screw it onto the front of my housing, and it creates this reflection when I take a photo, so the strobe light will bounce off a subject and it'll bounce all inside a tube and then you get this colorful circular reflection around the image. A lot of people don't really like this uh, effect, but I tend to like it in certain circumstances. In this case, the subject is a nudibranch, so it's a sea slug. Um, it's a pretty common one in the Indo-Pacific. I took this one in, in the Philippines. Um, and I just like how it melds into that reflection and it kind of looks like a wave, um, which I think is really neat. So uh, it actually looks a little bit like the logo of the company that I work for, Blue Water Photo. So um, that's also kind of a, a neat, neat thing about that image. Now, the way I got this lit so that you have this nice black background is I, I took what's called a fiber optic snoot. So what it is, it's a bundle of fiber optic cables that attach to your strobe and it takes the light from your strobe and it puts it out in a tiny hole, like a tiny uh, hole that creates a ring of light. So instead of having this big powerful strobe light that would illuminate the background, there's a tiny one inch ring of light. And it's really, really difficult, but you actually have to align that one ring of light directly onto the subject. And then you get a nice black background because the only thing being illuminated is the, is the subject. Um, it can also help to get a black background by increasing uh, your f-stop so you make your aperture smaller and um, that lets in less light and you want to increase your shutter speed as well and lower the ISO um, so that creates that creates a situation where you have less light coming from the outside and more light coming from the strobe uh, when you increase your f-stop that also increases the depth of field or the amount of the image that's in focus so if I had shot at a lower f-stop you might only see the front rhinophores on that nudibranch in focus and the back would be blurry. But in this case, I shot at a high f-stop, so most of the image is in focus there. Um, are there any, any questions about this image? It's a beautiful image. It's really gorgeous. Thanks. Um, for anyone that's wondering, I like to print on metal, um, especially with underwater photos. Underwater photos tend to be really colorful. Um, in metal, will actually, um, kind of illuminate those colors and make them really um, luminescent. So I really like that about metal prints. Um, this one I printed on metal as a circular print, which I thought was really cool. Now this is on PowerPoint. So it's actually the full circle is there. Um, in PowerPoint, it kind of crops it just a little bit. So um, I really like this photo because it, it really makes the subject, in this case, a squid, I uh, feel like it's in space. I actually took this, I think, the day after that, that slug um, in the Philippines. And squid are kind of fun because they change colors all the time. And they're really, you know, radiant and luminescent. And they reflect light really well from the strobes. Um, what's interesting about this photo is I have all these dots here that look like stars. So it's like a space squid. Now, all those dots are actually from particles in the water. And the term for that is backscatter. So... Um, when you have a lot of backscattering in your image, most of the times it actually ruins your image, especially if you're taking a wide angle photo of a subject. Um, 
And, and this is one of the few cases where I, I actually intentionally put backscatter in the image um, so that it, it, it accentuated the image, made it kind of look like the animal is in space. Um, I, the way you eliminate backscatter is you actually take your strobes and you tilt them 30, you know, you tilt them maybe about 30 to 45 degrees away from your subject so that 30% of the cone of light is illuminating the subject. Um, and that makes it so there's not a harsh amount of, you know, harsh direct light uh, bouncing off all these particles in the water. So that's how you get rid of some of those particles. But that's probably one of the hardest, um, hardest hurdles that you have to overcome as an underwater photographer is having backscatter in the water. We do have a couple questions I'm going to ask right now, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, you're asked, what's the most dangerous dive you've ever done? That's that's a good question. Um, yeah, actually, I, I have it. I, it was recently, uh, a couple weeks ago. So one of my favorite dives in Washington um, is also probably one of the most dangerous dives, um, I guess, in the world. I mean, there's other places that are more dangerous, but um, I was, uh, there's a place called Deception Pass where the currents get up to 14 knots. And um, for perspective, usually most people will cancel a dive if the current is more than two to three. Um, but it's there, it's almost always two to three. Uh, and it's tricky because you actually do it from shore. So you have to time it with the tide. So you go at slack tide um, and, if, and you want to ride the tide out and then ride it back in. Um, you have no control over yourself, no control over the situation. You just have to go with the water. Um, but it's gorgeous there. The, I mean, it's just, it's so covered in life. You can't see the rocks or anything. So, um, but recently I was there and I made a mistake where I timed it incorrectly. Um, and I got caught in a whirlpool for about 40 minutes underwater. Um, and the only thing I could do was just kind of hold onto the wall and, and wait you know, as this whirlpool was spinning in circles and kind of pulling me down. Um, and eventually the current let up a little bit where I, I basically ran out of air and I just scrambled for the service. And I mean, I, I didn't run all the way out, but I, I knew what I was doing. Um, but it's tricky because the water pool, well, I'm sorry, a whirlpool pulls you, pulls you under. Um, and my buddy on the same dive, he actually, he ended up getting shot a different direction and, and had to be uh, taken back to shore by a fisherman who was out there on a boat. Um, most dives aren't like that. That's a very special dive. Um, yeah, in terms of animals that it's, it's very rare where you're diving with any dangerous animals. Um, and if you are, they're usually small animals that if, if you get stung or bitten, um, that can, that can, well, they're, they can be poisonous, but, um, yeah, I've, I felt fine diving with great whites in a cage that didn't feel very dangerous. Um, and there's been plenty of other situations that, that didn't feel very dangerous. Um, I think my most dangerous animal interaction though was I was on a boat and um, a whale actually surfaced. It, 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 uh, it breached under our boat and it kind of destroyed the boat and I ended up breaking my nose. And um, so that was, that was, but that wasn't underwater, so. Wow, I'm glad you're okay though, because that's scary, getting stuck in a whirlpool for 40 minutes. I can't imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Yeah, you, you have to make sure you have a big tank on, on those kinds of dives. Well, and you have to let people know you're there, right? And, you know, yeah. or dive with a buddy or something. So, yeah. And, and there was a group of about 15 others that timed it correctly. So, that's good. Uh, yeah. Um, so, another question you're getting asked is where do you print? Oh, print photos. Uh, yeah, Bay Photo Lab is my go-to print shop. Um, they're based in San Francisco. They do a really great job, but they are fairly pricey. So I am in the search for another one that's maybe a little bit less pricey. Um, well, where, I, where do you print your images on metal was the actual question. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't hear that part. Yeah, Bay Photo Lab. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. I, I, I unmute, I accidentally remuted myself. That's why oh, I didn't okay. get that out. So, so it's the same place. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can go to bayphotolab.com. Um, they're in San Francisco and, uh, yeah, that, that's a good place to print, but, um, I'm sure there's other places where you can get metal prints that will be a little bit cheaper. Uh, they generally run, I think a 16 by 20 is about a hundred, $120 to print. So, um, 
but it's worth it in my opinion. Great. That's all the questions I have for now. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I have one more that I put in the presentation. Oh, two more. Um, so, yeah, this is, I, I like this photo a lot. Um, I think there were a couple other shark photos that I took that are like better, that are the same style, but I, I couldn't get them to crop in PowerPoint correctly. So, um, what what I think is really cool about this photo is the fact that it's underexposed. Most people wouldn't take a photo like this. Um, they try to expose it properly, but I, I kept it dark so that it could accentuate the light rays. And I think it really creates a feeling in the image of what it's like being underwater with a great white shark. Um, I also think, you know, this, the, the photo is kind of interesting because um, the light rays there can only really be captured during a certain time of day in the afternoon. Um, and it really helps to capture light rays when you have an overhead environment that are blocking light rays above you and the light rays are starting to come down in front of you. So that's a very rare situation. Often that happens in a cave. Um, in this case, I was in the cage. So the cage was blocking the light and it created a situation where the light rays were perfect, um, you know, going through the water. And um, I shot at a high shutter speed, a small aperture, um, Kept, kept my camera so the light wasn't going through very, um, or the, so it was restricting more light and it kept it dark um, and I ended up capturing this photo. Now, one of the interesting things you see here is, and you have to think about this, is you have some backscatter above the shark. And the reason you have that is because the light's reflecting off the back of the shark and going up into the water and it's actually producing backscatter there. So kind of a rare situation where that occurs, but it's, it's an interesting. Um, phenomenal. That's a beautiful photo as well, and, and others are saying beautiful work. I noticed that, that's, by the way, that light scatter, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and, and I don't think you can really see it with your eyes, but it, it, it is captured with the camera. It's one of the things that I kind of have to deal with when I'm editing uh, great white photos. Um, and, and this is also a good example where um, I was actually out there because I had to deal with an advertiser. Um, so we have somebody that advertises on our site. They wanted us to come out, take photos, write an article about it. Um, so that's, you know, kind of the one, one of the big perks of the job. Um, and I spent, I think, about a month down there in Mexico. Uh, this is off the coast of Mexico, Guadalupe Island. So. Um, Yeah, and then uh, this is, I think this might be the final photo I put in the presentation. I've got plenty of others um, I can always go through, but uh, this one I just, I really like for a lot of reasons. Um, the same thing is actually happening here as the last photo. Um, so the light rays are going through, I I'm inside of a cave and the light rays are going through, on, through the water on the front of the cave. And my camera was able to capture that um, now, what's being exhibited here is what's called dynamic range. So there's a large range of exposure from the really bright part of the image to the um, really dark part of the image. And you can see that there's a lot of detail in here in the dark part of the image. Like you can see the rocks in the cave, you can see some of the textures. The reason for that was I was shooting a, um, a full frame camera that's really capable of capturing that. If you do have a less expensive camera, what you'd end up Having, having is um, just kind of, you wouldn't be able to see the details. It would look just dark here and you wouldn't be able to see the rocks and that. So, I mean, in my opinion, that's one of the main differences between an expensive camera and an inexpensive camera. I shot, I mean, a lot of the photos that I was showing you, I've shot with a $250 camera, um, but this is kind of a good example of what you can do with an expensive camera. Now, um, Another thing I like about this photo is I took this without strobes. So you don't have to have strobes for every underwater photo. Um, all these other ones, I mean, well, except this one, you know, all these colors are from strobes. Uh, in the case of this photo, there's no strobe light. Um, I'm pretty shallow, so the colors are still there. You can see some orange in the rocks from some of the sponges. Um, and I just, I, I sat at this cave for maybe 20, 30 minutes and I knew there were sea lions in the area. So I just waited until a sea lion swam in the perfect, perfect position and I, I captured the shot. Um, 
so a lot of underwater photography is waiting and that's kind of what I wanted to end my presentation with is that a lot of it is just, you know, being patient and waiting for the right moment and, and capturing that. And that's amazing. Where was this again? Where'd you take this photo? This one was in Baja, California, uh, down in La Paz, Mexico. Um, I know a lot of our audience is younger, but when you do get to college age, it's, and hopefully there's no pandemic, it's actually an easy drive to get down there um, from California uh, if you do happen to be on the West Coast. And um, there's these day trip boats that will take you out to swim with sea lions, and that's actually a really, really cool experience. Um, and that's cool. I did yeah. go to Baja and saw blue whales, went out uh, to do some trips. Uh, down in um, off of Loretto. Um, yeah, this this is just south of Loretto. Yeah, it was gorgeous. Yeah. We flew into Loretto and then we went down and got to see gray whales and touch gray whales. We went across the peninsula and then uh, went up into the Baja Peninsula inside, and um, it was great. It was amazing. So yeah. I highly recommend it to everybody. Yeah, I think um, Baja is a really underrated place. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, if I had to choose between going to Hawaii or the Caribbean for a vacation, I'd, I'd go to Baja, so. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's gorgeous, although I've not been to Hawaii, so I'll have to get there someday. But yeah, that's more common <laughs> on the West tell. Coast, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you then if, it, if <laughs> I still say Baja, so. Uh, so listen, everybody is just saying what amazing photos, what beautiful shots, and what um, uh, great information, so. So I truly appreciate this, Nirbhom, that you took the time to do this. If, if anyone has any other questions, if you even want to send me um, an email and I can pass it on to him, um, that would be great. So uh, if there aren't any other questions, and I don't know, are you all set, Nirbhom? You feel like you got your photos? This was the last one, correct? Yeah, this was the last one. I, I thought it might take some time, so I, um, yeah, so I, I kept yeah. it. They're story. amazing. So, you know, I'm always looking for your photos. I'm always looking for your name somewhere next to photos <laughs> that I see thinking, I wonder if that's him. Um, but I truly appreciate this, you guys, and that everybody came and we'll, we'll have a video um, of this as well. And um, he, he recorded it. And I don't know if it's your site, but I was hoping we could also put it in our YouTube channel so people can find it. Yeah, uh, so we will do that too. Yeah. So many, many thanks to everyone. Uh, and uh, Take care. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks everybody for watching and uh, I hope you guys have a, have a great day and a great summer.